I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. Today we have a meeting of our Language of Wisdom study group led by Jerry Northrup. He'll give introductory remarks about um, symbolic formalisms, something he has thought a lot about. Thank you. Yes. Um, I continue to struggle with understanding uh, wondrous wisdom in terms of the English description. And I find that natural languages in general have lots of problems, uh, English in particular, but I think it, it pretty well applies to all of them. And you have multiple definitions of a word. You have a word which means different things. The same word can mean different things. Different words mean the same thing. Uh, you have the ability to express <laughs> ideas that are nonsensical. Uh, uh, this statement is false, whether it's true or false, it, it, it's kind of nonsense. So that kind of stuff gets in the way of understanding um, on a really clear kind of, of way the kinds of ideas we're talking about. So what I'm been doing is going back to uh, getting rid of the words and looking at the project of how do I set up a symbolic formalism, a new language in a certain sense by, by identifying and creating symbols on a sheet of paper. So you'll see the symbols on a, on a computer screen and it's kind of drawing, um, but it, it starts with the notion that certain primitive types of drawings and symbols have, have meaning in their own right. And that by starting this way, uh, we start to build things which begin to look a little bit more like math uh, than natural language. And hopefully this will, um, will lead to a, a better way of, of visualizing or understanding the kinds of concepts that we're working with. And I've I did this a lot with developing Odo and I'm falling back on that now to try and expand that understanding into wondrous wisdom, which I think is, uh, and basically I'm going to be operating at a kindergarten level here now. I think wondrous wisdom is an, uh, an evolving, uh, an extension of some of the ideas I, I did with that. So that's kind of the college level and hopefully uh, we get there. So, so this is just the blank page. This okay. is kind of like Descartes. You, you blank it all out. I'm going to have a symbolic formalism, which I'm going to represent on uh, a sheet of paper or a computer screen. And I will draw on that. So we start with a blank page. The simplest thing to do with that initially is to just put a point on it. That's the start. So that's kind of the, you can start with a point. Uh, as the simplest thing, that's just the existence of the beginning of the formalism. And we can make the point bigger or smaller, it still is just a point. So the next place you go, the next thing you can do is to draw a line. That's 4B. And the line is a fundamentally different concept than the point. Uh, it it um, is a different appearance on the screen. And it has a, a different kind of um, foundational meaning. Now the line can be can fill the whole screen. It can go from the top to the bottom, as in, in five. Um, so there's the notion of is the line have points on the end? Does it have ends, or does it go as far as we can see? Is it indeterminate on that? And that we don't really know. It's an indeterminate kind of situation. We can put points on the end of the line, uh, but it still is, and then it's a combination. It's a combination of the point idea and the line idea. So we go with that as is then our second fundamental concept. We now can add another line that uh, intersects and connects with the first line. And this is a fundamentally different concept. It's not just two lines, but it's a, it's an actually, it represents the area. It represents the sheet itself. 
And so it's it's not like multiplying two distances to get a new distance or you multiply two distances to get an area. Uh, it's a different kind of concept here. This So this is the, uh, the next evolution in the concept, which is uh, representable as, as a surface area. Uh, and again, we can make it bigger so that it, it goes off the end, or you can put points on the end of the uh, on the end of the um, line segments that we're seeing in Figure Six. The thing that now throws a monkey wrench in my development of this is this introduction of the concept of an arrow as Figure Seven. Now you have a line, but it has an arrow on the end of it. So this is now connoting something, not just a connection between two points, uh, but it has the idea of a direction, of movement, of uh, impl imp implementation, not or implication, uh, operation, process, sending, a vector, an evolution. And it's a, it's a fundamentally different concept, although it sort of looks like uh, the concept in seven. And if we expand that as in seven B and you send it up over to seven C, uh, is it a line that's connected to another line this way? Or is it in the center? It, it, and I find this confusing. I haven't used this in the past. I didn't know what this means. So it wasn't in part of my, uh, my development. So I introduce it here as the critical problem, the issue. And then we move on and, and we'll leave that, we'll come back to it here in the future. But if we move on then from the concept that's shown in, in six and seven to eight, and here now we have a line that connects with two other lines. So the endpoints, the end of this, this line can't be represented by points, they're represented by lines. And again, we can extend the lines that are connected to the ends of the sheet, or we can end those with points or what have you. And this is now the fundamental concept that we can recognize as volume or space. It's different than area, it's different than distance, uh, but it is a, a new concept type of thing. And so we go over to, uh, to nine, um, if we, Put a diagram like this, what looks all together, we see actually this could be uh, something like 9D. If we go over to 9B, uh, you can see that you've got a line and it's intersecting two other lines. So it starts to look at like a coordinate system. The notion of representing space as we understand it is this volume with three lines, but the lines have different meaning. There's the distance line, there's the, the area line, the surface line, and then the volume line. And so that leads to this notion, the Cartesian coordinate system uh, in 9C, uh, where you can, you can write it that way, you can put a point in the center, um, and it's, it's a way of representing space. Now, it doesn't represent time, and this may be back as to where we're going to go with, with these arrows. But once you've got that, you've got this notion of space, or you've got a, a notion of an area, you can then make a distinction and a boundary. And that is fundamentally different than the other types of, of lines or point. So we've got a point, we've got a line concept, we've got an area concept, we've got a space concept. And now we've got a distinction. <clears throat> the thing with a distinction is it has an inside and an outside. Uh, and so that is that is fundamentally different. If we go over and we back and look at the line where it goes off the edges of the paper, we can say that's a distinction between one side and the other. But this gets back to the Mandelbrot fractal sense um, as to how how big are, are we just taking the, the line segment and magnifying our look at it, and then we get something that's in, in uh, 10A. So 10B is, is the line segment. 10A may actually be the same thing, and we've just taken a, an area of that and blown it up. 
So it's the notion of how long is the coastline of Maine? It's a question of how big is your ruler? So it's how big is your microscope or your telescope in terms of how you, you see these kinds of things. So that <clears throat> then evolved for me is that once you've got the notion of a distinction, a boundary, and the boundary can be a sphere in space, it can be a circle on a plane. Um, it may be you can look at it as a point in the middle of the line. But once you've got that kind of boundary, you can then cross the boundary. And that I represented with just a line that goes across the circle representation of the boundary. And it could be for a, a sphere as well as a circle. Once you've got the notion of an inside and an outside, that kind of boundary, you need to be able to label it so that you can tell them apart. Because if you blow it up so that it's like this, are you on the inside or the outside? This is just a, a cartoon kind of, of thing where you, you take a line and you put a little circle onto it and, and then you can attach it to things to give them names so that you can tell them apart. And then once you've done that, and this, this last symbol in 13 just becomes how you integrate all these things together. You connect them all together in some kind of way. And so that resulted in this um, 14 diagram Really too bad I can't blow that up. And that was the construction of the of the Odo language. It started out on the top with the four initial concepts: the point, the linear relation, relational relation, interrelational relation. And then going down the side here was kind of a reflection on those. Once you create a distinction, you can have a cross of the distinction, you can have a, a label for it, and you can have it interrelated with, with everything. So that from an evolutionary standpoint, this is the most primitive. This becomes a second reflection of that. And then as you combine these in an evolutionary way, you take this symbol and you add the point, you add the line, you add the, the relational relation, the interrelational relation, and, and you keep going. You end up with a third form which is the circle, two circles connected, the circle connected to two others and, and what have you. So it's an evolutionary point in three ways, uh, first stage, second stage, and then the last stage here. But now we come to the, uh, to the wondrous wisdom divisions of everything. And that's in, in slide 15. Uh, slide 15 has got some words in it, so I stripped the words out, and now it looks sort of like what I was talking about here, but it's got this arrow, and the arrow is, I don't know how to represent that in terms of the symbolic formalism that I previously created. So, but you've got, you know, it's almost like um, Alice's Restaurant, where Officer Obi, when they were arrested for littering and uh, brought him up into court where he had lots of pictures of the litter with the circles and the arrows and the paragraph on the back of each side. So here we've got lots of little circles connected by arrows in various kinds of ways. And that looks very similar to what I was doing if I map my system into the circle so I've got the point instead of the circle, small circle. I've got the line instead of the arrow between two circles. Um, this would be a representation in a different way of the cycle, which I have talked a little bit about before. This becomes the, the foursome concept here. Um, and then this doesn't make sense, particularly as to how it maps there. So this is a very primitive thing, and it, it doesn't really help there. Because if we look over here at the different kinds of arrows, that could be involved with my interpretation here, um, you get a, a very different sense as to what's going on. And the question is, what's inside the circles? Uh, what's being distinguished from what's outside the circles? And when we connect them, you can just connect them like in, in 16A2, connect them together, that's sort of the way I looked at it. But now when you add the arrows here, it could go one way, it could go another way. 
a different kind of representation in the middle. It might be able to go both ways. Um, what does this mean in terms of how do you evolve this uh, formalism, uh, foundational symbolic formalism to go? And I, I have this strong sense that, that this has real meaning and I don't know how to translate it in because you could look at a cycle with arrows connecting circles and coming back on each other. You can have a circle that just connected back to itself. You can have just a, a circle with an arrow in it. Um, and how does all this um, come back into a formalism that you could look at from an evolutionary sense as making, making a pictorial kind of pattern that we can use um, to do things and understand who we are and what we're doing. In the sense that the language I created over here in 14 was useful to me in terms of how I developed eco-technologies. And I see what Andreas has created over here in 15, uh, that, that cycle as being useful to him and how he has created his understanding, his mind map, uh, and then how you can use that to understand ways of thinking and that leads to how people understand uh, or interact with each other. So to come down to 16A where I have the circle just uh, with a cycle, it's got an arrow in it. And then if we take the concepts that Andreas developed as a mind map on the inside, our inside of our consciousness, and we move them to the outside, does this provide some kind of pattern as to how we can say that an organization of conscious entities can be itself conscious? So that uh, if the point is just existence, and then the existence has three manifestations, three languages, three forms of consciousness, which goes back to the uh, initial point, line, surface, volume, um, can, can that be incorporated as a, as a circle over in 16D, where you've got those together. So this then becomes a circle either inside or outside of, of the wondrous wisdom circle. And maybe then the wondrous wisdom circle 16B uh, becomes something like what's in 16D, and then it can become connected through arrows or through other kinds of connections to the other uh, conscious entities. So if, if this becomes a representation of, of a conscious entity, uh, can we use that to say, okay, it's, it's how the conscious entity itself thinks, thinks in terms of the three languages, if the line, the T and the H over here represent languages, they represent uh, forms of consciousness, unconscious, conscious, and consciousness, uh, then can we look at a similar kind of structure where this becomes um, something that's inside the circle, inside the circle, inside other circles, and then connect those in this kind of, of way? Are there, is there a path there? to develop a, again, symbolic kind of representation as to what this might be. And the use of the circles and the arrows, um, which I'm still puzzling with, it starts to look like some of these diagrams that I see with the uh, category theory or the, the bond dilemma, uh, some of this advanced math kinds of, of stuff that Andreas is, is pursuing. And the notion then is, is there an evolution where you start very, very simply and you develop concepts which um, represent who we are, how we deal with an external world, who we are, how we deal with an internal world, the way we think, and then who we are dealing with other uh, conscious entities to form organizations of conscious entities, which itself becomes conscious. And is this 
a language which can convey that kind of understanding without the use of, of English words to go with it. So it's still very much a, a muddled situation for me, but I find it really fascinating again in terms of how wondrous wisdom, the divisions of everything is an evolutionary step beyond what I had created with Orodu, and it has the similarity of, of uh, symbolic structures. This notion of circles and arrows, uh, arrows connecting to other arrows, lines connecting to lines, lines connecting to circles. What are the fundamental patterns of that that may map back into our understanding of who we are, where we are in the universe, um, who I am, who you are, how we interact, and, and that sort of thing. So that's what I'm I'm working with. And I think this presents much better if I could have shown the individual slides. I'll get that figured out for next time. But um, so that's what I am, am going to uh, be pursuing. And I think it it does. Um, does have potential, uh, at least for me, to make for a clear understanding of what these ideas are without relying too much on the English words. So. Thank you, Jerry. Um, thank you for all the effort you're putting in to learn this wondrous wisdom. You're, you're really the person who uh, is making this huge difference uh, for me. Uh, and so every time that you pick a topic like this, uh, it stimulates me. I have some responses I've been thinking of in the in the last few days. Um, and uh, we've had in the chat, uh, Daniel and Kirby have this discussion about three dimensions, two dimensions. So why don't uh, Kirby and Daniel, you express your ideas? Uh, and then Jerry, then why don't after that you kind of explain where you'd like this to go further? And then I can maybe add my thoughts too. Go ahead, Kirby. Oh, I'm good. I'm good. I always do that. I always do that. I mute myself right when I want to talk. S smart man. Um, yeah, because the theme is kind of like early beginnings or primitive beginnings or axiomatic beginnings, or let's start from like a blank sheet and build it up. It's like, let's start from the beginning. That's kind of the theme. And what occurs to me is in a kind of pre-literate non-lexical society where we haven't invented paper and we're not writing a language a lot. If I'm sitting around the campfire as an elder and I wanna to talk to the kids and I say, this is how a man thinks, like here's his thinking. I might hold up a walnut or something. And if I wanna say this is a line, I would hold up like a cane, like I'm doing on the screen right now. And I say, here's a line, and automatically I can turn it in every direction because it's in space. And I think once we committed to like hieroglyphics and squiggles and communicating on a flat surface, we had to kind of dumb everything down in a certain sense. And now all our models are automatically, we don't even give it a second thought, our models of course are diagrams on a flat surface. We don't say, you know, this is a system. We would draw like a triangle because it fits on a piece of paper, whereas volumetric, it's awkward. You can't put that in a book so easily. I've always thought we don't use color much. I see color starting to creep into some of these. Um, you know, the more colors, the more expensive. But in today's world, I think we're retreating. That's kind of a Marshall McLuhan theme. I think we're kind of going back to the primitive because we're looking at screens now that are taking in space. Like you look at my head and I can hold up volumetric things. So I think the days of purely lexical modeling where we're always flat, I think that's gonna be challenged now more. Thank you, Kirby. Yeah, thank you, Jerry, for the presentation and for these diagrams, it's like, first principles and whether it's tangible or embodied or more of an axiomatic these are very important exercises 
um, a few pieces that it reminded me of. One is Kandinsky's work from 1926, Point in Line to Play yes. In, right. which is like also kind of starting from a artist's hand, but similar to Bucky Fuller saying, well, even a grain of dust or like an abstraction of a point is metaphysical because it has no mass, whereas any, even a grain of, you know, draw a triangle on the board. But then when the teacher does that on the board, you know, whiteboard, blackboard, there's little molecules. So those are little mini tets. Um, and then Curry made very interesting points about the screen. And uh, many people have explored that literacies and the flatness. And then I think also the idea that there's a classical or dimensionally reduced screen or interface, and then a quantum unfolding associated with cognition. That's a really interesting idea. And you kind of got to the Markov blanket slash interface model with the possibility of the nested modeling. And so there's just a lot of pieces here and, and then my last comment will be, we've also talked about some of the more qualitative foundations. So it'd be interesting to be like, okay, here's an event. I got a gallon of milk at the store. Here's another event. Those are like point, 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 point. And then it's like line, 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 mm -hmm. line. Here's the letter A. Here's the letter A. Here's the letter A. Here's the letter B. Here's the letter A. But that could be graphical and it could be with a with just reading of a of a wiki page describing what is an A versus you know line. Because I totally agree with your with and I deeply respect the effort you put into going beyond just the lamentations of language. Well, let, let me make a comment about your reference to Kandinsky. Uh, that abstract expressionist movement was uh, was quite influential in a certain way in, in some of this development. You start with uh, Malevich's, uh, where he just had the point, the black point, as the start. That that was a work of art. It goes back to the to our our, our first diagrams type of stuff. That that, that is there. And you have Modrian, which is talking about boundaries. Um, that kind of work is there, and then then you have Calder, where you start to to get things moving around in space and and what have you. That that kind of uh, representation, I think, is is akin to this. Um, the story about that John Hand, who made a lot of the initial uh, videos for Timberfish. Um, and he was a very gifted uh, videographer and what have you. He described when he was in uh, art school uh, that they had an assignment where the art, the teacher came in and he took a shoelace and a tack and stuck it onto a, a board and said, okay, what does this mean? And everybody fussed around and fussed around and it came back. It was the concept of line. And it was viewed as being a profound kind of message or understanding there, this, this notion of what can a symbol be. And, and it's like if the if the shaman is holding up a walnut and holds up a stick and and stuff like that is, is the relationship and builds these things into some kind of, uh, you know, um, thing. I don't know, my wife describes how they build these, these uh, and PC figures and what have you that, that represent fundamental ideas in, um, relative to a, a primitive society. Uh, and I do think that the spoken language, spoken languages and, and um, the physical languages like music and dance and, and um, <laughs> storytelling and stuff like that have a, a certain superiority over this kind of symbolic representation on a sheet of paper. Um, so that, you know, ultimately, I would think that, that I used to go back and assign 
frequencies to the uh, to the various symbols. So that if you look at, at the first line in, in 14 here, the dot, the line, the TDA, that that would be on the piano would be the key of C, E, G, and B. And then the second one over here, would well, that would be you know C major seventh, and this one could be a D minor seventh. So it's D, F, A, and, and C again, so that you could actually represent all of these words with just sounds, with chords, uh, and a similar kind of thing to do it with color, uh, how you can take a black, white type of thing, and you could do three primary colors, um, red, yellow, blue, or three primary secondary colors, uh, purple, green, orange, um, again, and how you construct that with, with other things. So it's, uh, yeah, how, how do we tie all that kind of understanding, capability of understanding into um, a symbolic formalism that, uh, again, it, it looks to me like it, it starts to drift very much into uh, to man. Um, I look at this problem I'm having with the arrow versus the line, and I've always looked at language in terms of kind of a quaternion structure. And I'm reminded of this uh, conflict that arose between uh, Gibbs and Hamilton after Hamilton had, had uh, discovered the quaternion and was pushing that as a basic um, formalism for physics and what have you. And Gibbs came along and, and said, no, it's a vectors. It's a vector analysis type of thing. And so that was a big discussion in the late 1800s um, as to which is the, the more fundamental way to go. And Gibbs went out and became vector analysis that, that kind of dominated physics for a while. And an interesting part of that is that Charles Sanders Peirce, his father, Benjamin Peirce, uh, was a professor of mathematics at Harvard for a long time. And he was a strong proponent of the quaternion. Uh, and it's interesting then that, that when his son, Charles Sanders Peirce did his, uh, the semiotics and what have you, that he pretty much stuck with a three. It was more like a, a vector analysis approach than a quaternion, although he kind of cobbled it together a little bit. So he had kind of, he put the conscious um, originator in, in one of his threesomes. So um, anyway, it's the kind of stuff that percolates around here. How do we generate the simplest possible set of symbolic formalisms that can convey this kind of profound sense of meaning on an evolutionary scale, both individually in terms of internally and externally, in terms of how do we participate in society and is society a, a conscious entity of its own right? And uh, you end with a question and I find that um very helpful way of pulling it together, um, just the types of ideas involved. So the simplest possible symbolic formalism to um, uh, portray the meaning um, for a society which could actually be a conscious, right? Is that something like that? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, and so it's, and it's, it's just a blessing to be with all of you and, you know, but with Jerry that you have worked on your private language, so to speak, and you've actually constructed this language. Um, and I've worked with a private language, Wondrous Wisdom, um, and that we have, you know, maybe it's just superficially, but they certainly seem structurally, you know, related. And so the question is, well, that helped bring us together. And then the question is, what what can we make sense of that? And so our efforts, uh, your efforts, my efforts, all of our support is relevant. So the thoughts that I have regarding this, um, which may be wrong, but um, kind of like what you're saying, uh, symbolic formalism, that's where your attention has been. And for me, that's like speaking about the shadows, you see, you have, or the, the reflections, let's say, you know, there's the reflections in the water. So there's the trees, and then there's the trees that you see in the lake in the water. 
And so the trees in the lake would be like the symbolic formalism. You know, maybe they're simpler, maybe they're more pretty, maybe they're just, you know, available. But um, so whereas what I've tried to do is um, skip that whole thing and just get to the trees, you see. Now, is that possible? And how would you do that? That's a whole question. When I listen to you um, and how you think, uh, it reminds me of what I would call maybe my missing years, you know, like, I have a very clear understanding of when I was six years old and, um, you know, I went to God and I, I wanted to know everything, apply that usefully. And I kind of made my, you know, decision what to do with my life. And then I was just mostly learning, um, uh, just trying to read as much as possible, learn as much as possible. And then around 17, I actually realized, you know, hey, I'm not going to get there by reading. I have to think, you know, on my own. And so that was where I made the progress with the two, some three, some four, some with this, you know, how do you talk about absolute truth, et cetera? How do you focus on wisdom as opposed to looking at things like physics or whatever, where it's in physics and quantum physics, I, I had no knowledge of it, but I just the little I knew just seemed to be that it, it all just smears out like nature's saying or God's saying, like, don't look here for fundamentals. You're just not going to find it, you see. So I thought, well, it must be where... Uh, is the easiest place for a human being to look, but no one wants to look. So that's like the study of wisdom. You know, like we're designed to be instruments of wisdom, but people are really not interested in wisdom um, as such. So, but when I think about these missing years, I can kind of like empathize with the way you think, like it's just kind of maybe awkward to say, you know, when I was seven or eight or nine or 10 years old, maybe we all, you know, do doodling and then you meditate on those doodles and you think about those doodles. Also, like, um, I think that was very helpful, this distinction, like three dimensions, two dimensions, like in the womb, I don't think there's any dimensions, really, you know, like we're just, you know, our, your eyes are closed, probably, or, you know, what do you see in the womb? So, uh, but, but I think even like with the two dimensions, this idea that we're on a third dimension, like godly looking on the plane, you know, so this is kind of like godly relationship, like what's out there. So I think... Spending time, maybe what, and I'm just making this up, but I think I must have been doing that like seven, eight, nine years old, doing exactly what you're doing, like playing with boundaries, playing with things, and just mentally thinking and thinking and thinking. Then when I became like 15, I remember I had a chance, uh, I was thinking about physics. So I was drawing doodles and arrows, like in saying, well, what's the difference between mass and energy? You know what I know, but I think like about draw some points and draw some arrows that go to themselves and draw some arrows that go kind of like what Daniel was saying, link, 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 you know, and trying to show my teacher, and he goes, well, just keep doing what you're doing. You know, there's nothing to be said. So, and then I just realized like it wasn't, didn't seem to be going anywhere, but I can tell you now, like now that I have a PhD in combinatorial, algebraic combinatorics, and I have a bachelor's in physics and I look at the wave equation and I see, oh, there's orthogonal polynomials there. And I try to decode them. And what is the combinatorics there? It turns out it's very much these causal diagrams, you know, like it's not very different from the types of diagrams that you draw and I was drawing and etc. So I'm just kind of like recover in, in my own way. I'm just kind of like reliving things I normally wouldn't get to talk about. But because of your efforts, you know, I'm trying to respond. So that's just uh, all in there. Um, is it good to flesh that out? I guess that's what's coming out from me. But what I wanted to say in terms of thinking about uh, your um, letter and trying to think about like, how do I get across my you know understanding? Uh, well, oh, I think so what happened maybe as I was becoming 17 was to try to flip it all around. Like instead of focusing on the symbols as artifacts that help us contemplate and help us meditate and help us dig for meaning, which is kind of like where what you were doing and you know what I was doing and maybe what what all the doulers do. I said, no, 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 this is not the reality. The reality is to flip it around. What is it that is the reality, you see, that doesn't need to be visualized? And then so that's where the divisions of everything started to come in. And then using diagrams simply as a shorthand, uh, to uh, sketch, you know, like to remember, to document, but not as the uh, foundation for what it is, but rather it's just notation for describing, you know, that experience uh, just to jot things down. So alternatives, I just wanted to say like, you know, and computers allow that, like animation. So 
uh, I, I would probably, I could maybe, maybe I should create animations of these where you don't need arrows, you see. So like, let's say you just have, like for the twosome, you just have two dots, let's say a red one and a blue one. And, you know, the red one is there, it goes away, and then you see the blue one, you see. It's just uh, the red one and then the blue one. Okay, and then that's it. <laughs> like so, uh, or like with the three cycle, you know, a red dot and a yellow dot and a blue dot and a red dot and a yellow dot. They could be in a circle. They don't even need to be in a circle. They could just be the same dot, just changes colors three times. You see, that would be a three cycle. So the arrow is not there to mean anything. The arrow is there to de denote a change in state. Okay. So in an animation, maybe there's no reason to have a, a circle or you know just have three different colors and they just alternating, but they're alternating in a specific direction. Same thing, like the when you have the two sum, it's two dot, it's two colors, but they don't alter. Like there's a first color and a second color. That's it. <laughs> you see, so so um, that's maybe a helpful way to think about it. And another thing that was helpful, also oh, virtual reality is another way to do it. You know, can we model it with virtual reality? Like, so I very often think of it as a walking through the rooms of a house. You see, what's the shape of the house? And if you've seen, uh, Dave Gray asked me to draw a picture of these things. How would you? So I have these, uh, maybe I could pull it up, uh, but uh, um, I called it Lookout for Outlooks. And maybe I'll share my screen to, um, but the point being that uh, I had these creatures that, uh, I had these creatures that uh, thought backwards, let's say. I mean, they walked, they looked backwards than from the direction they were walking. They couldn't see where they were going. Um, let me see here. Oh, picturing divisions of everything. Yeah, I'll show this here. You may have remembered this. Daniel hasn't seen this, but. Uh, so it's just another way to visualize. It's a little bit more like the virtual reality. Okay, like here's the two sum. Okay, one small step is one giant leap for Alex. So here, this guy, you see his feet go in one direction, but his eyes look in another direction. I call him an outlook. He says, oh, I have free will to change my state or not, change my mind or not. I can choose between opposite, stay or go. But then when he goes over here, it's like they can't go anywhere anymore, you see. Here he had a choice. He doesn't have a choice anymore. There's fate and it is all the same. There's nothing I can do, nowhere to go. Because his feet don't go this direction. His feet only go that direction. His eyes look this direction. It's kind of funny creature. And then so this outside, inside, you know, when I think outside, then I also think inside. They're opposites. But then he moves. He goes, when I think inside, it's just all inside. You see? Or it could be world and self. It could be, you know, so there's different things. But there's basically different versions of the same thing. Or like this three cycle. You see, he's looking backwards, but he's moving forwards. And he just goes round in a circle. Or the knowledge switch. And with the knowledge switch... I think with the foursome, you see, with the nullsome, onesome, twosome, threesome, it's like a single eye, a single perspective. But with the foursome, there's really two creatures. Like, how can go to what? But see, why can go to whether? But I think, like, you need two creatures. Like, if how goes to what, then the why can cross over his back and go to whether. Does that make sense? So it's just a funny pictures. Um, so this is how I would draw them. And so it's kind of about thinking. And so uh, maybe to say one more thing, um, uh, I was uh, doing Israeli folk dancing this Sunday. And so this idea of the dance step, like that a single step doesn't make sense. You have a group of steps that makes sense. Like, so, and now they, then they take those and they make complicated things with them. But like, so like a waltz step, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You can't just do one waltz step. They come in threes, right? Or like uh, the foursome is like, you know, it's uh, it, it, the step goes this way and then there's another step, right? So there's these two stepping processes that are hooked together. By themselves, they make no, no sense at all. So, um, but it's just so hard to talk about. Like, 
I have more to say, but any thoughts here? I just want to say how hard it is. Like, I just joined the Pierce uh, list, uh, which has very, you know, distinguished element people. And one of the people I found out about, I, I'm starting to collect these um, uh, these uh, lists of um, uh, conceptual structures, you know, these frameworks. Uh, I'm making a catalog. Uh, so, and I can show the catalog. Um, but the point being that, so I'm starting to look for them. And... Um, I found a, a, a Wikipedia page on trichotomies. So trichotomy, dividing everything into three things. So this, there's like a list of, they actually give examples like 15, 20. So I go, who put that together? And so I looked in the history of the page and there was a man, he calls himself the Tetrast with, for four. And uh, his name is Ben Udell, which is ironic though, because these were all threes, you know, but he's into four and he has blogs where he's trying to explain like everything is really made up of fours. So, but he's in the Pierce list and they only believe that things are made up into threes, you see. And the, but the Pierce list at least is better than just saying, well, it's just all dichotomies, you see. So that here are all these uh, distinguished people, but like going from two to three is hard enough. But like the from go from three to four is just like, it's just impossible. He's lead this group for 10 years and he can't find anybody to think in terms of fours, let's say, right? So I don't know what to do, but, but the point being like, here's a list uh, like, Pierce talks about first and the second, third of this. These are all these three minds, unconscious, sub, you know, conscious consciousness. I mean, I have 15 examples already, um, but it could just go on and on. You know, I mean, like, that's the point. Uh, so this is how I think about them. I think about them in terms of these just uh, tables. And there's a little bit of that in your, um, in your uh, paper, Jerry. But that's, see, that makes sense to me. But and maybe like to make sense of what you're doing, I would want a language of verbalization, language of argumentation, where you could say, well, when your mind passes across a boundary, you see, this is what's happening, right? Or like when your mind needs to make a distinction, this is what's happening. So in a certain sense, I'm not caught up to you yet. I'm not there yet. So we're 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 stimulating each other though. Yeah, I, I think because I look at that as that you're evolutionarily way beyond where I am. Well, we're just in different, but we get. I'll catch up with you, and you'll catch up with me. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, I, I think your thing is is evolutionary beyond what I've been working with, uh, pretty much, and so I, I'm, I'm trying to get up to that that point. So I, thank I. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Daniel. Jerry, you're, I think that's very kind to say. There is a sense mm -hmm. in which it is true. Also, I would offer that it's not merely some kind of progression not even like evolution necessarily is either but rather that the constructivist approach always has some pedagogical value but i wrote a comment about how we can approach that 2d plane from the point to line to plane mm -hmm. but that zero to one to two can only ever be nested within a something else we can talk about what's on the blackboard, but that could only happen in a classroom. So I just saw like the teacher going through the examples on the board as a first language, as a second language, as a third language, and that's pedagogical. And that's something that we can like carry around. That's like our inner compass and we build up and that helps us like jump further. And then also you could be like, well, I wrote the, you know, the notation for the um, friction equation five different ways, you know, five different modalities. We did a smell-based friction equation, but at some point, what you you have the real objects and the friction. And then it's it's a more um, pluralistic, instrumental contribution to just focus on the tooling and the notation. As people may use it for things that Andreas doesn't see it for. Whereas taking the classroom centric approach leads to a, a, a total portfolio of notations. And so there's a fruitful relationship. Oh, do we have to end now or can we continue? Or is this the. I, I'm going to leave, but okay. you can, you're the host, you can continue. Thank you very much.
Thank Carol, you. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you, Daniel. Bye. Okay, see you. Kirby, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are we, sh we should have a, a civilization that rescues more Andreas and Jerry types who want to think foundationally with their diagrams and stuff. Too many of you guys, we just send you to the front line and you get blown up. Sorry about that. Yeah, some of those biographies, like, you know, they're the people who didn't necessarily get blown up, but like whether it's Wittgenstein or, I mean, there's different, you just read in the First World War how many went were signed up this is uh, just amazing and i guess some of them probably went voluntarily you know they i remember when i was talking to mandelbrot one time he uh came to portland anyway but his view was the reason we got so anti-visual like his whole fractal thing was very right brain visual mm -hmm. but you know before him bourbaki you know the goal there was to do as abstract as possible with as much algebraic kind of notation as possible and as few diagrams as possible mm -hmm. right don't rely on visualization whatsoever because somehow that's not eternal or something and he was very down on that he would fight like that and he would say the reason we had bourbaki is because all the good mathematicians were killed in the war <laughs> oh, that's... but um but to be said to that for me as i mean i went into combinatorics because i somehow felt like I didn't want to get lost in that abstraction. I mean, it's, just, it's very hard to do. Maybe it was too hard for me. I don't know. But uh, but I think it was, I just felt like there was value in the concreteness. Why run away from the concreteness? So uh, the, the, I couldn't understand why would you, you know, I mean, would focus on the simple things. Like, so I thought combinatorics is like the basement of math. So why not focus on the basement if you're interested in the foundations? And how do objects come from in that? There aren't that many combinatorial objects you could come up with, you know, like so in a certain sense, like that probably is kind of limited, you know. So um, I think that's one of the th maybe ways to approach what you're doing, Jerry, is to think of it as an exploration of just the limits of what a mind can do with, uh, you know, diagrams. There's only so many things you can do, I think, maybe, I suspect, if they're simple enough. I came up with this one oh, inspired by Jerry. Oh, it looks good. It's just six things. The first one's like the idea of a boundary and uh -huh. it's also a circle and empty and filled. That comes in right from the beginning. Is this empty or full? And then the next one is less symmetric. It's kind of rod shaped, but it's definitely biased. So my second frame is first symmetric, then it's kind of biased. And then the third one, what is the third one? The third one, we get the idea of totally random. Mm -hmm. And that's important. You know, you got to have chaos. You can't really get anywhere unless you have random. And then the next one, we finally get to the most primitive enclosure, which is like a tent. So there's the tetrahedron. That's our first inside-outside division uh, in a three-dimensional sense, the way people talk, 3D. And then sphere, also 3D, but you can see there's an arrow straight from the circle to the sphere because obviously they're analogous. And then my most abstract, the final thing, is just purely empty space. So I reversed it. I said, you know, you don't really think of empty space until you get pretty advanced. That's like the last thing where you can just think of space as a thing. You know, we don't start there, we end there. So I just decided to play with, you know, my little formalisms. <laughs> and you Which did I that in, up right, in, in right 10 minutes it talking. didn't take you 20 years <laughs> that's cheating yeah that's <laughs> what i'm thinking that these are things that maybe you don't want to spend a lifetime on maybe you just want to do it in an afternoon it's disturbing Kirby. that's very <laughs> disturbing <laughs> now you know where were you 20 years <laughs> 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 but um Moving away from what Kirby just said, <laughs> I'm gonna edit out certain things, but um, <laughs> but um, no, in terms of this language of verbalization and hooking into this concept of usefulness, like the Jerry's brought up, and maybe like you know usefulness even in terms of things like we have a society where there's a disconnect, 
how would you have a society where there was connection, you know, with what the people in charge, let's say, or everyone's in charge, where like, you know, right now we have a disconnect. So that's like an example of the twosome. You go from the disconnect, hopefully, to the connection, not really the other way around. So, or at least that's the mo that's the way I would model it uh, or suggest it at least. But the what I'm trying to think is that uh, trying to work on a language of verbalization, you know, like how do you get symbols? How do you get words that could actually mean something or colors or like you said, musical chords or whatever? How do they acquire meaning? Um, clearly, there's all these different disciplines where you can play that game. So it's a kind of game you have to kind of maybe focus on things. But one concept that came up in what you were doing was the notion of the page. See, so... The difference between, let's say, a wondrous wisdom and maybe like something like verbalization is that wondrous wisdom refuses to think about the page. It says, no, 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 you can't run off the page. You are in the, you know, you are in there. You can't run away from yourself. But the fact is, is that when we have a language where meaning arises, that God's eye view that, oh, I'm seeing the third dimension. You can't see me, but I can see the other two dimensions, right? Like that's um, that's part of the game of uh, giving things meaning or having meaning arise is to segregate that uh, scope, that domain. So like having the page, then as soon as you have that, you can start to play games with the boundary of the of the of the page. Then you can have like a a realm within the realm, so to speak, and you can have connections between the realms. And this whole thing, how are you going to carve up the whole? So those are the types of issues that you were kind of describing. Like, you know, how is this? Uh, and so in a language of verbalization, I think that that would be. Uh, and so maybe it's just a matter of uh, picking um, something that we're interested in. And I think to go back to the eco-technology, like if you made concrete, how is this useful in eco-technology? Can we think the way you do, you know, in eco-technology? Those issues maybe would come up, that verbalization language, or maybe something in a sphere that uh, Kirby cares about, you know, or maybe ant colonies or something. I don't know. But Daniel would care about. I do care about fish, too, so. You do care about uh, fish. Okay. Um, back to this notion of taking something concrete um, and and trying to... Uh, to tie it back as to how I always felt that, that both the development of the language and the symbolic structure that I've been using and the design sense that I've used for eco-technology has been closely interrelated. As I, I developed the language as a tool to use to try and understand and, and work with the, uh, with the bacteria and the ecosystems and all that sort of stuff. So I don't, I don't know exactly how, maybe I should just try and explain exactly how that. Oh, well, I think so. In my and mind. We, so that's, I, co I was collecting the ways you figured things out. You know, we could do more of that, but maybe from a different angle. But simply, I first of all, because of you, I think that's very good, like to do something that you have a lot of intuition in that you could show where it connects. But even just thinking about like waste management, there's this notion of segregation. You see, like with waste management, I think part of the big part of the game is like keeping things away from each other, you know, is a key idea probably, right? Like you're not wanting to mix it all together. You want to be able to keep certain things away from, you know, other things. And so, well, then that's exactly what you're doing with the symbols, you know, like clear boundaries, like, you know, uh, clear connections, you know, introducing that clarity like Kirby likes so much. Um, so I think if we thought about more what that means in your particular case, that'd be very helpful. And we have, you know, uh, you're a biologist, but also Daniel's a biologist. So to see, you yeah. know, the ant colony world uh, may give clues too. They have a whole, you know, I mean, among their professions, they have basically this uh, waste management issue, like, you know, what they call the mid right. midden, I think, you know, they're like cleaning things out, you know, keeping, I think like fungus control is a huge driver for the way they're structured. Uh, the inside of the nest seems to be very sterile, and they just seem to spend lots of energy keeping it sterile. And then, um, and then uh, I think that's a major reason for this purity gradient. Like, you know, once you go out into the world, you don't come back, basically. You know, there's these levels of cleanliness, and you don't go back inside, uh, deep inside, if you've been out, way out there, picking up who knows what. So... 
cooties or whatever they are in the ant colony world. But um, I, that's, I have a general question about wondrous wisdom that might fit in here, mm -hmm. which is like with Peter slaughtered Dej, or I even pronounce his name, there's a lot of emphasis on immune system and defense mm -hmm. and antibodies or, you know, all that, that whole metaphor. It's like, where do I find in wondrous wisdom the idea of defense? Because as you remember, I said my attitude towards truth was, um, yeah. I think it's a good defense. If you if you're truthful, your 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 story won't crumble because it's based in truth. Whereas if you spew out a lot of lies and lose track of who you've told what, your story gets out of control and it crumbles. So that's kind of what I mean by uh, truth is a good defense. So wondrous wisdom. You know, there are different ways of responding to attack. You can, um, you know, martial arts. It feels like with OODA loop and with your three cycle, there's an implied martial art in there. And I think every school has kind of that flavor to me once they become a wisdom school. It's like how to respond interpersonally in difficult situations. It's not always choose the most aggressive approach or something. And this is where taking a stand is, uh, it's, a, it's a proxy for what you actually do. You might stand up and take bold action, but you might uh, leave the room. I don't know what you do, but I'm just saying there are many postures that one could take. So when I'm thinking of wondrous wisdom, I'm just wondering about how does it help, um, say I'm somebody who just can't afford to stick my neck out much, uh, in my life situation, this is made up, but let's just say, mm -hmm. then what disciplines will I get? How can I learn from wondrous wisdom, how to be effective in the world and yet have a low profile? I guess that's kind of what I'm looking for. Well, I think, and this may be, you know, more about words and, and, you know, choices of words. So, but I think it's it's not, you know, like a stand, like I'm going, <laughs> it's more like you said, having a definite posture. Like my posture may be like, I'm going to leave, <laughs> like, you know, I'm going to leave, right? Or I'm just going to shut up, right? Or whatever it is, you know, it's, um, those are all postures. But the point being that with the three cycle, they need to be definite because if they're not definite, then you, they don't have any accountability. They don't have any, like, there's nothing to come back to. So uh, that's what I mean by you took a stand, right? But it was... I mean, I was a very weak child, <laughs> so I was not a, uh, I'm probably brave, braver now than I ever was. But I mean, well, I used to, anyways. Um, but, uh, and then also uh, when I was, um, after graduate school, I was a tutor in Chicago at Ivy League Tutoring. And I met a friend there, uh, Stephen Bonzak, and uh, he was really into martial arts. He later became a, a Chinese medicine uh, doctor. But um he was into Kung Fu. And so we went through together with me, I guess like we thought through this eightfold kind of principle of that, which was very much like what I call this eightfold way. But basically, I think it was like a three cycle. And I think like the three cycle, I, I need to find those principles again. They, he was the one who taught me that slack is good. So this whole idea like that, uh, you know, in my vocabulary, like, you know, everything is the structure of God. God is the spirit of everything. Uh, Slack is the structure of good. Good is the spirit of slack, let's say, right? So that type of relationship. Uh, and so, but one of the things, one of the ways it would go, like you could center yourself, right? Like find your center. That's one of the ways that you do. Because then once you find your center, then you can operate with regard to your center. But first you have to find, you know, if you've been thrown to the ground, or like you have to find your center again. Uh, so, and I think there's a kind of three cycle to that. Like that's probably the first step to this three cycle. With the eightfold way, um, that's like the relative truth is based on the learning cycle. But the absolute truth is like, if you're connected to God, let God think, you know, rather than you think, let God do, like let God be, right? So there's that whole, so there's this wavering antenna. Like if I'm in touch with God, then let God do. But then God goes back and says, you're fine. Go go out and learn, you know, whatever. Whereas, like, if you're in the learning cycle, say, God, help me, help me. And then you kind of find God again and you go back. So it's a very wavering thing. Does that kind of make sense? Or does that? Is yeah, that, that's kind of good. But I'm I think all these. About it. 
all these well, types of things that you're adding, like the immune system, or another one is evolution. You know, where does evolution come into uh, wondrous wisdom? You know, which is such a key. We're going to have this whole meeting on that. Uh, I mean, it um, came up when you were talking about how ants spend so much time keeping their environment sanitary yeah. and then we've talked a lot about how the queens in some tribes are protected by this layer where if you've ever gone out you can't come back in that kind of stuff mm -hmm. that's all like protection and there are downsides too so once you get into that meditation you know when we talk about politics there's always that pattern it's a general pattern language pattern where some high level person is always surrounded by yes men you know people who always agree because they want to keep their jobs, they want to stay ingratiated, so they're psychophantic. So there's that pattern where a leader is surrounded by people who never bring the outside in, and mm -hmm. therefore they become more and more disconnected from reality and less and less able to make good decisions. You know, we can just at random make up science fiction stories based on all these patterns, but you can trace mm -hmm. them back to like a, an ant tribe, a yeah. colony, as embodying all of these patterns. Let, let me go back to this uh, yes. the notion of, of the ant colony having their own waste management and then the defense type of thing. Our brain actually has that too, because there's a whole physiological stuff that goes when we go to sleep, mm -hmm. that clean, kind of cleans the brain. And it, mm -hmm. it has its own plumbing system and a, its own way of, of getting rid of a lot of those uh, residual neurotransmitters and all that kind of crap that kind of clogs up the the system it's probably the real reason that we sleep is is to do that and the, and the whole notion of defense as preventive maintenance or ma preventive maintenance as a as a form of defense um so and so so um these types of studies, like, and so that, that was a nice exercise, and I'm still continuing with the ant colony epistemology, but first of all, it shows the power of wondrous wisdom just as a mental prejudice, saying there's got to be three minds, you know, but like, when, at least I'm at the point where like, I see the value of that, and I just see like, the, that, at least my mind is so damaged, I just can't see the other way of thinking, but like, you kind of need a mind that's semiotic, you know, that's kind of saying that just reduces everything to this kind of sterile language, you know, which is quite a few steps away from, you know, direct experience, let's say. But deep in the heart of the ant colony, you know, they just have this sign language of smells, basically, you know, that they, they smear their foreheads with, let's say, and then they pass it on from one to the other. It just seems, that just seems to make sense. But, uh, and then the other one where they... Um, I really like the idea too that it's the nest maintainers and maybe the like you know the people related to the patrollers and the nurses or whatever but like so much control you can get between those other two minds if you just change the chambers you know if you just seal off the queen for a while right like you know I just keep her like keep her under control for they just uh, I mean there just seems to be so much uh, power there and also I think like in terms of uh, reproduction you know, that like when you realize that uh, the chance of an ant colony surviving when it's founding is very, it's not that great. It's like 50% or maybe less, you know. So to think they must have a lot invested in really timing things right, but also like understanding all of the politics of the other ant colonies out there and when's an auspicious time to actually, uh, you know, be uh, sending off uh, new queens or drones or whatever. I think that um, to say, oh, no, that's just genetic clocks or something. I don't think that that makes, you know, I think it kind of, I don't know. Um, so, um, but, but, but the idea is like when something's missing from wondrous wisdom, it's good to say, yeah, that idea needs to be somewhere. And so also like I've been, I keep focusing on more of the inner world, like God, I, you, other, but these languages or this other I mean, evolution kind of implies that there's lots of others and you get to choose between them. So um, that's something I would not have been focused on before, but I should, you know, get get to that point. Like, so in Wondrous Wisdom, or at least basically in maybe the Catholic theology, but at least like this idea of hell, you see, like to say, well, what gets destroyed? But in my reading of it, it's kind of like um, 
there's this continuous choice between yourself and the and God. You know, what do you like? Like, if you're just attached to yourself, that's why not have that burned away? I mean, like, you know, all the bad things about me, like, why wouldn't I want that burned away? So if I was attached to God, or that's a good, just burn it all away and clean me, right? But if I'm attached to myself, that's like an eternal torment, you know, that, oh, you're you're destroying me. You know, it's just basically a matter of attitude, whether it's hell or whether it's, uh, you know, eternal hell or whether it's a uh, cleaning. Or evolutionary pruning, let's say, right? Or... Um, so that's a mystery. Like, what is what is evolving? Um, or, or like building, you know, having things unfold top down, but then having them. This came up in the in the video with John Harlan, where okay, let's say you have a physics that kind of unfolds, but it says there'll be some limitations. Then go back and say, build it back up from the limited parts. And then you get a new top-down view and then, then unfold from that and then build it up back from the, you know, from the new set of parts. So you keep kind of restating it in terms of parts. And so maybe that's important. What you're doing too is like, you know, you're forcing me to think, oh, look at it from the top, look at it from the bottom up point of view. Like, you know, how are you going to build up this symbolic language, right? Where are you going to, let's say you don't know anything. See, because maybe the strength of what you're doing is you're able to do what you did with total ignorance, so to seek. Like, you have to look at it as a virtue, right? I mean, like, you don't need to know nothing to do what you did. You just need to start drawing, right? Like, isn't it? See, whereas I'm trying to think, like, how does God understand the, or, or do something very contradictory? Like, yours is very non-contradictory, I think, right? Whereas, like, mine is, like, these weird, you start with a state of contradiction, and you go, well, what would you do if you were in this very weird state, right? Like, I don't think that yours has that kind of like a contradiction. So it more it's more like this is the logical thing you would do, right? So this is the value of you know you kind of I you know I think of you as the leader, but I try to really of this language wisdom. But in a sense, it's, it's crucial because you know you keep picking a topic that's the one that I'm not that I've overlooked, right? Like the one that. Uh, so if you keep picking these topics, we'll make we'll make progress. I think we're making made some progress today. Um, and so, but it does really help that you write the letters. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and do a little more of that earlier. Any maybe is this a good place to stop? Any more final comments or? No, I burn out after a while, so it's okay. We're all burnt out. Or Kirby, what's I, your? I, I just want to say I'm glad that the wondrous website wondrous wisdom wiki continues to be evolving like those pictures you showed today with the creature mm -hmm. i've never seen those before i just haven't i'm not always sure what's all there mm -hmm. um and and i value these websites because i feel that the role that they play in the world is like there are people who are at their wits ends and they're just trying to figure stuff out however they do it and they'll stumble across a website like yours where everything's connected to everything else. There's like Lithuanian folk tales, <laughs> Chinese, every topic has a potential. And that's why they're there, right? They were following some some Lithuanian thread or, or how to <laughs> figure things out and stuff. And then because they encounter your website, it's like a roll of the dice in a good sense it's like here's a whole other track you may have never thought of and because they come to your site it's like a switchboard it's an exchange so for some people it's an end in themselves itself more like for jerry it's like wow i just want to sit here and study this for a while and that's a good right. thing and then for other people it's like they'll go through it you won't even know they went through and yet it's made a positive contribution because it's like a vast switching yard. And that's what somebody needed at that point. Yeah. And knowing, um, I think I, uh, truth be told, like, you know, I've, I've had that wiki up for or different wikis up for like 20 years or 30 years or whatever. But I think maybe once someone from Pakistan wrote me and say, Oh, this idea you had on coherence. That's what, I was thinking about like, but I think it happened like once, you know, maybe twice. But, but um, people aren't people aren't usually very communicative on the internet. Often right. they're browsing very anonymously and very surreptitiously, almost you could say. So yeah. don't take lack of emails 
Yeah. Like when I used to track my analytics more, I don't study that as much because the web was new and I wanted to know how many visitors I would get 20, 30,000 hits a week sometimes, but I oh. would rarely get any emails from anyone. So, you know, it's all hard to measure. But I like think they say you influence everything and you control yeah. nothing. But I think that um, one thing I do believe in is that um, if the YouTube channel, um, well, I think the, the the discussion group, you know, the wiki, it is evident that um, there's a tiny community here. And I think that that is quite noteworthy and precious. And, uh, and uh, so that's so thank you to you, you know, and. Okay, then um, who would say the prayer today for us to release us from? <laughs> well, Kirby, you, you've you've been so good. Um, <clears throat> thank you for wondrous wisdom, um, O cosmic being, and may we continue to thrive in your care. Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. What do you get from the conversations we have together? Oh, so, you know, you've been always, always very encouraging of me uh, exploring maybe novel ideas, you know. So, you know, I've already, I get that from you. You know, you're sort of my, in a way over the years, been my, bit of my conscience, uh, you know, like, uh, that compels me to, compels me to keep working. Um, and then the other aspect, I mean, I, I think there's other aspects, like, you're also very open to, you know, kind of novel ideas, so, you know, even if it's kind of some harebrained thing, like I, I think of time editing or his, history editing or something, which is really non-physical, non uh, at, at least at this point, you know, you're, you're at least open to that conversation.